most respected Thay, dear Sangha, this is a wonderful moment of being together as we listen to the three sounds of the bell. We will practice uh, our togetherness like we did a moment ago again. <coughs> to feel that we are all practicing the same thing at the same time. So we come into phase. Breathing in, I dwell in the present moment. Breathing out, I know it's the most wonderful moment. Thai, dear beloved community, today is the 10th of March in the year 2024. We are in the upper hamlet, the Dharmakloud Temple, uh, the Stillwater Meditation Hall on our day of mindfulness. And today we will continue to look at the 14 verses on meditation. Uh, last time we were talking about the ninth verse and I would like to continue a little bit with this verse. Emptiness, signlessness and aimlessness liberate me from suffering so that in my daily practice I am not caught in mere intellectual understanding. So I think that the last line, I am not caught in mere intellectual understanding, uh, is there because emptiness, signlessness, and aimlessness can be just ideas and notions. But Thay has always taught us that these three doors of liberation are not notions, are not ideas. They are concentrations. So they are our daily practice. And that practice of those three concentrations liberates us from our suffering. Concentration is when we can maintain our focus on something for a, an extended period of time. Uh, we practice mindfulness and our mindfulness can lead into concentration. 
we train ourselves. We train ourselves to be able to maintain our mindfulness for as long as it needs for there to be concentration. If you want to know more about the uh, three doors of liberation, the Dharma seal, then we need to go to the uh, Chinese uh, canon and uh, we have a, a sutra in our chanting book uh, taken from the Chinese canon. And uh, we will uh, see a little bit what that sutra tells us about the three doors of liberation. First of all, the Buddha said that emptiness is the Dharma seal because emptiness is the nature of all things. So it is a seal of all Dharmas. And then the Buddha shows us three doors by means of which we can enter into the nature of emptiness in all things. And the first door is emptiness. The Buddha said, find a quiet place to meditate, like uh, the root of a tree, a forest, or a or an empty, empty room, to meditate on the true nature of things. Normally, we do not see things in their true nature. We see them through our perceptions, through our habit energies. And our perceptions rely on signs. And the Buddha said, wherever there is a sign, there is a deception. We are deceived by signs. We come to that later. There, there, when you meditate on the true nature of things, what is the first thing that you see? You see that the body is impermanent, always changing, unstable and empty. There are different versions of this sutra and the one in the Taisho, uh, it says that you can see that the body is impermanent and suffering but in the version in the Agamas, or the Agamas also, Agama, the Samyukta Agama number 80, it says that it doesn't say the body is suffering, that feelings are suffering. So when I was revising the chanting book, I took the liberty to leave out suffering because the body is, the nature of the body is not suffering. The nature of the body is, is neither suffering nor happiness. Suffering and happiness are things, ideas that we attach to the body. <coughs> Impermanence is not suffering. Impermanence is the true nature of things. And when we meditate on impermanence, when we dwell deeply in the present moment, we see that we don't know what is going to happen. Things, our body, our feelings, our perceptions, our mental formations, our consciousness, are different at every moment, 
are changing at every moment. And when we, when we really dwell in the present moment, we will see that change taking place at every moment. And so we really don't know anything about what is going to happen in the next moment. And life will re- keep revealing itself uh, to us. And when you see the impermanent nature of things, you begin to see the no-self nature of things. Because the self is always the same. When I was five years old, 30 years old, 80 years old, then always I think of myself as the same self. But in order to get to 80 years old, you have to keep changing, changing, changing at every, every, every second, every millisecond. So seeing that, seeing the impermanent nature, seeing the no-self nature, you are, you are no longer attached to your body as myself. You can see more closely what the body is, the feelings, etc. And then the Buddha says, the five aggregates are produced from the mind. When the mind stops operating, the aggregates stop operating as well. So we need to understand uh, this sentence. Mm. The five aggregates we know are the body, the feelings, the perceptions, the mental formations, and the consciousness. And when it says they are produced from the mind, it means that that is the way we divide things up. That is the way we divide ourselves up into (coughs) body feelings. But when we meditate on the five aggregates, we find that they are not separate self-entities. We find that without the feelings, there cannot be a body. Without the perceptions, there cannot be the feelings, and so on. And so the, the five aggregates, they, they inter are. They don't have a separate self. And that is uh, what is meant by uh, when the mind stops operating, that is when the mind stops grasping to things as, uh, as separate selves, we will no longer see the five aggregates in the same way. We will see them like in the Heart Sutra, uh, are not separate self-entities. So that is the meditation on emptiness the concentration on emptiness. And in order for us to be able to realize that concentration, it needs to be maintained. Not only in our sitting meditation, because we don't have a very long sitting meditation. We have just half an hour or 40 minutes, enough to to touch an insight but not enough to maintain the insight. To maintain the insight is in our daily activities. We, we keep our concentration when we are walking from one place to another. We keep our concentration on the emptiness of things alive in us. And in the beginning, that concentration, it may be a little bit uh, intellectual. But uh, don't worry, it is uh, like uh, when you make a coffee, it has to, uh, has to percolate down. Huh? Have to percolate down into your store consciousness. So the second uh, door of liberation is called signlessness. We talked about signlessness last time, as putting things into boxes. 
You put uh, the orchid into a box. The first box is a flower, a plant. And the second box is an orchid. But uh, that box, it doesn't allow you to see the, the true nature of the orchid. Because there are, if you were to take the sun out of the orchid, the water, the cloud, the moon, the stars, there would be no orchid. So it's not a, a, a box on its own. It includes everything that is not in that box. And we need to uh, meditate on ourselves like that. When you dwell in signlessness, the Buddha says, views concerning me and mine no longer have the basis and the occasion to arise. Because we put ourselves into a box. And that box, it could be a, a superiority complex, it could be an inferiority complex, equality complex, an idea of what I am. But that idea is based on something that has happened, something that someone has said, something that you have done in the past, and it's no longer a reality in the present moment. So signlessness is also a way for us to recognize our no-self, no self-nature. If you take your mother out of you, your father, all your ancestors out of you, you will collapse. You won't be there anymore. The third Dharma seal is uh, here is translated as aimlessness, sometimes translated as wishlessness, ap apranihita. Pranihita is to, to grasp something that is in front of you. Apranihita means not grasping something that is out there in front of you. And this is the uh, way that aimlessness is described in the Sutra on the Three Doors of Liberation. Consciousness and the conditions from which it arises are always changing. The consciousness skanda is empty of a separate self. And therefore, how is it that we can grasp to something out there? if it's always changing and consciousness is always changing. This is a very uh, deep uh, teaching <clears throat> for us to uh, look into the nature of consciousness.
So consciousness, we talk about uh, no. New consciousness. We talk about having three, three parts. So this is the first part. Sometimes we call it perceiving and sometimes we call it perceiver. Perceiver, it could be. And then the other part is called perceive. And in Sanskrit, this is called the darshana, darshana bhaga. And this is called nimitta bhaga. The seeing part. And the the whole is called a svas svas viti bhaga, which means the 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 self realization part. Yeah, that is the whole. We normally we just I pay would uh, ask for a euro, and then uh, with the one euro, you see one side, and one side is the perceiver, and the other side of the euro is the perceived. But they both belong to the same metal coin. You cannot separate them. You can't cut your euro in half. And so these two things can never be separated. Maybe it would be better. I can show you with a piece of paper. Mm. If this is the perceiver, then this is, the recto is the perceived. You cannot cut in half. Mm. So that is the nature of, of consciousness. And we just read that consciousness and the conditions that give rise to consciousness are always changing. What are the conditions that give rise to consciousness? The perceived gives rise to the perceiver. And the perceiver gives rise to the perceived. We were talking about the beautiful trees on my island. So we would put, if we were dividing, we would put the trees here. And we would put my island here, or my consciousness here. But now we... Uh, so you have trees. Huh?
perceiver. Consciousness here, we mean perceiver. The trees uh, are oh, what are we doing? <laughs> the the trees and the consciousness they there isn't one that comes first and one that comes second. How do you draw that? I don't know. I drew it wrong, huh? It looks like one comes first. When you have feedback loops, it looks like one comes first. But in fact, th there isn't one that comes first. They arise together. And the trees give rise to consciousness, and consciousness gives rise to trees. There were a, a, um, a team of in the uh, U.S. and they wanted to climb Mount Everest. They had to train for many months, maybe for years, in order to prepare themselves. And much of the training wasn't only physical training, but it's also psychological training. So we have to have a very strong aim, a very strong wish, in order to be able to succeed in getting to the top of Everest. So that uh, aim, that wish, that Mount Everest, it become a, a, something you put in front of you, something pranihita, something that you are going to attain. And you convince each other that we'll do it, don't worry, we, we're sure to do it. Huh? How do you know? Everything is changing. Everest is changing, the climate is changing, you are changing at every minute. How can you make that? Hmm. How can you make that wish, that aim like that? And so uh, they came to Nepal, they came to the foot of Mount Everest, and they were told before they set out, one thing you have to be very careful about, if at four o'clock in the afternoon you have not reached camp, I don't know which camp, huh? camp number three because there's different camps at different levels, don't go on. You have to come back because higher up than, than camp three, at four o'clock, the storms begin and you don't have a chance of getting to the top. So, come back, huh? If you don't get to camp number three. So when they got to camp number three, look at the time, it's after four o'clock. But they have that aim and that wish, so they say, never mind, we can do it, huh? And, of course, they all perish. Their wife, their children, they also have to suffer a lot from that. So that is an example of uh, not living with things as they are. Not knowing yourself and not knowing side of you.
சோகம் So the beautiful trees on your island, they are there because you have given them your attention and they are a seed in your consciousness. And therefore when you want the beautiful trees, you can, you can have the beautiful trees. And there are other things that we give our attention to and we don't really uh, want, want those things. We don't want to keep giving our attention to those things. So we should do something that is called a changing the peg when those things come up and put uh, something else in our store consciousness. Because our store consciousness is always changing. Uh, Vasubandhu say it's like a a waterfall, like a, 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 a stream that is running very fast. And because we cannot separate the perceiver from the perceived, the two things are changing all the time and changing each other. So this has also to do with the not getting lost in the future because the future is also something we put outside of us. He thinks in the uh, knowing the better way to live alone. The practitioner thinks that this is how my body will be in the future and he is attached to that idea of how my body will be in the future. This is how my feelings will be in the future and attached to the idea. Then that person is caught in the future. But if you think how my body will be in the future and you are not attached to it, then you are not uh, caught in the, not caught in the future. You are looking deeply into how your body is now and you know that when you are 80 your body won't be like that if you're not 80 already. So this is how we understand uh, aimlessness. It is a matter of uh, epistemology. So don't uh, aim for something, wish for something without recognizing that the causes and the conditions have to be right for that thing to manifest. Your separate self cannot make something, uh, something manifest. Your, you, you do your part but there are also causes and conditions that are not your part and you need both. So this we will look into later. You can look at uh, verse 10. Nirvana is non-attainment. Sudden or gradual enlightenment are not different. 
true realization is to live in freedom right now in this moment. That is a little bit like the verse from the Bad Ekarata from The Better Way to Live Alone. The practitioner look, uh, yeah, looks deeply at things just as they are in the present moment. So, Nirvana, many people have written books about Nirvana. I don't know how many books there are, but there must be hundreds of books about Nirvana. And uh, in Buddhist dictionaries, there's, in Sanskrit or yeah, dictionaries, there's always pages about Nirvana. But in fact, we usually say that Nirvana is the non-conceptual, the non-verbal, so I don't know how we can write so many books about, about it. It is like uh, <coughs> writing books about God. God is also non-verbal, non-conceptual, but uh, how many books have been written about, about God? So one thing we can, uh, that has been said uh, many times and is repeated in the 40 tenets of Plum Village, written by Tai, Nirvana is the extinction going out. Doesn't mean the extinction of the practitioner. The extinction of delusion and the afflictions, but not the absence of the skandhas, the sense fields, and the datus. So there are two, uh, two obstacles to nirvana. This is the object of our afflictions, the, the, the obstacle of our afflictions, our fear, our anger, our jealousy. When we are afraid, we are angry, we are jealous, we cannot be in nirvana. I think that is obvious. Huh? And the other one is shnevarna, and that is the, obst- the obstacle of the knowable. Here we cannot let go of our views, we cannot let go of what we know. We cannot let go of our perceptions. And all the, if you know, the 14 mindfulness trainings of the order of interbeing, you will know that the first three of those mindfulness trainings are all about transforming that obstacle of the knowable. Actually, these two things, they go very closely together. Because if we have views, if we have uh, perceptions we cannot let go 
obviously we are going to have anger and fear and so on. So that is in short what we can, how we define nirvana. Nirvana is the extinction, because nirvana apparently comes from a verb to, to blow out your, your flame, to, to put out the fire. What do you put out? Some people have misunderstood and they think that what you put out is your five skandhas. When the five skandhas, the body feelings, etc., are not there, then there is, uh, can be nirvana. So when, do you get, when can you enter nirvana? When you die. And when you enter that uh, nirvana, when you die, huh? you uh, enter what is called eternal death. I think that we don't practice in Buddhism in order to realize eternal, eternal death. We practice uh, living in the present moment to be very alive in the present moment. You know, when you read the uh, discourse on the four establishments of mindfulness, at the very end, the last bit, the Buddha says something like, someone who practices mindfulness for seven years will realize either uh, complete understand, fulfill understanding, complete understanding, or if there is some residue, some remainder, and some remainder is this word, And upadi means grasping, clinging. And it is grasping and clinging to the five skandhas as myself. So the, we can talk about the five skandhas that are free in the present moment. And we can also talk about the five skandhas of grasping. And what is the obstacle is the grasping. It isn't the five skandhas. You don't have to die in order to, to touch nirvana. As Thay said, in fact, you have to be very much alive. So this what the Buddha said is, you can realize complete understanding, that means nirvana, or if there is some remainder, some residue of the grasping to the five skandhas, you realize the fruit of what? No more return. The first fruit is Arad, second, no more return. So after that, uh, we have uh, the idea that there is two kinds of nirvana. One kind of nirvana where you are completely free. Nowadays, people translate nirvana as freedom, very often as freedom. Completely free of the afflictions and the knowable. And there's another kind of nirvana where you have uh, still some of the affliction left. So in the tenets of Plum Village, Thay say we don't need two kinds of nirvana. One kind of nirvana is quite enough. But actually, Thay doesn't say which. Uh, 
which time? And then when I was teaching in 2000 and, uh, 2012, 2013, I said that um, we all have the nirvana with the remainder. We can all enjoy that because we know there's still a underlying uh, afflictions that we have not managed to transform. So maybe that one nirvana is the one with, uh, with some remainder. But do people like to divide things into two? We will see uh, in the next few verses many things we can divide into two. So all the Buddhist uh, mainstream schools talk about nirvana as being unconditioned. It doesn't come from causes and conditions. We saw that the orchid, it comes from causes and conditions. It comes from the everything that is not the orchid. But nirvana is, is not like that. In the... Um, in the... Chinese uh, Dharma Pada, there is a chapter on Nirvana. I think it's chapter 36. And the fifth verse of that uh, chapter, falling into unwholesome destiny is conditioned by unwholesome action. Birth in the heavenly realms is conditioned by wholesome actions. So that means that if you are reborn, and it could mean reborn uh, right now in this very life, or it could mean reborn when you, when your death certificate is signed, and you have done many wholesome things, or you can have a birth with the gods when you will live a long time, have very little suffering, except when the time comes to the end. And then if you do many unwholesome things, you will fall down into somewhere where you suffer a lot. Those two things are due to conditions. And then it says, very surprisingly, nirvana is due to causes. It also needs conditions. But we always talk about nirvana as being non-conditioned. So what does, what does this verse mean? So the example that the Thai gives is when I was living in Thai's hut out there in the three-month winter retreat. And every morning Thai would wake up and come to the meditation in this still water meditation hall. And for Thai, that was a wonderful moment because the air outside is so fresh and the stars in the sky, are, we can see 
many, many stars in the upper hamlet. It's so beautiful. And so I could just enjoy every step to the meditation hall. And I would uh, not want to hurry, because if you hurry, when you get to the meditation hall, the air is not quite so good as it is outside. So sometimes that I noticed that there were uh, brothers who were missing from the meditation. So <clears throat> if uh, your uh, roommate says to you, come on brother, get up, it's time to go to the meditation, you think, oh no. I didn't sleep enough last night. You pull the blanket over your, your head. Mm. So I said that, well, if you do that, you will miss the beautiful morning. You will miss the stars. You will miss the fresh air. So that is the example. So nirvana is like that. It isn't that beautiful morning, but it is like that. It is always there. It's waiting for us. But we don't want to be in touch with it. We are not, we are not able to be in touch with it. So when we say that nirvana is due to causes, it doesn't mean to say that it's made up of the sunshine and the earth and other things. What it means is that it's up to you whether you want to touch nirvana or not. It's up to your practice, your practice of mindfulness, of dwelling deeply in the present moment, that is the cause which makes nirvana possible for you. But nirvana is always there. It's part of your consciousness, it's part of the, of the, <clears throat> the fully realized the consciousness. It's part of the... Uh, yeah, part of our uh, experience, for us to experience. So when we say that uh, nirvana is non, non-attainment, it just means that we don't have an idea of what we are going to attain. We use the practice that has been handed down to us by the Buddha and the ancestral teachers in order to be able to to be in touch with nirvana, but we don't have an idea of something out there that is to be attained. So it is when you when you uh, practice mindfulness, concentration, and insight. It is like when you open the window. Say you open the window because you want a fresh breeze to come into the room. Well, if there's no breeze outside, the breeze won't come in. But you open the window and your practice is is just that. You open the window so that when when the causes and conditions are right, then then uh, you can touch nirvana. So this has something to do with the next line that says sudden or gradual enlightenment are not different. So this is something that happened in China. Division between uh, two what they thought were two different ways of practicing. 
And one way was called the Southern School, and another way was called the Northern School. And according to the Platform Sutra, there were two uh, monk disciples of the Master Hongren, who was the fifth, known as the fifth patriarch, the fifth, sorry, sorry, I don't use that word, the fifth ancestral teacher. Mm. So, he had uh, two disciples, and one uh, was called Sheng Xiu, and the other was called Hui Neng. <laughs> and Hui Neng represented the non- uh, the non, more non-intellectual side. And Sheng Xiu reckon, maybe represented more the intellectual side. And it is said, but this is a story told in the Platform Sutra. It isn't what happened. Because historians now tell us that uh, Sheng Xiu and Hui Neng, they were not in in uh, Hongren's temple at the same time. Sheng Xiu had already left six years before Hui Neng came. So this story never really happened. But it just shows us how people like to divide things in two. And uh, luckily, Tai put the two back together. Maybe there was a reason for that. Maybe one has got two intellectuals, so we try and make it less intellectual. And maybe the other has not enough intellectuals, so we try to make it more. And so when we have divisions in Buddhism, sometimes they are useful because they complement they, they each other. But when they start fighting with each other and driving each other out of the out of the town because uh, they don't belong to our, our school. That's gone too far. But in, uh, in Vietnam, they had the Vong Ong Tong school and the Vinitaruchi school. And the monks, they stay in the same monastery, live very harmoniously with each other of both those schools. So sudden enlightenment means that we all have the Buddha nature. And if we all have the Buddha nature, then it can appear at any time. And gradual enlightenment is we have the Buddha nature, but we have to purify our mind in order to be able to touch it. So it takes time, it takes time to purify your mind. So there are stories uh, about uh, sudden enlightenment. And uh, one story is uh, one time uh, one master asked his disciple, what do you understand of the Heart Sutra? And he said, I understand no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. And so the master took hold of his nose and uh, twisted, no nose. <laughs> so he had a sudden enlightenment that, uh, in fact, <laughs> I have a nose, <laughs> but it's not a separate self-entity because my nose hurt, my whole body hurt also. My feelings hurt too, yeah. So that is sometimes sudden enlightenment uh, happened like, like that. One time another monk was practicing, I've forgotten which monk, and, uh, but he was practicing, he was dwelling in the present moment, and he was hoeing the earth, and a stone uh, flew up and hit the bamboo and made a noise. And the noise caused him 
to become enlightened to the interconnectedness of all things. So that is uh, what people think is sudden uh, enlightenment. But uh, we talk about uh, little enlightenments that can happen to us every time, any time of the day. Every day we can have an enlightenment. We can uh, drop our old perceptions and see something we haven't seen before if we are practicing mindfulness and concentration. So, this is the uh, meaning of sudden and gradual. We don't need to make that uh, distinction. When you listen to the sound of the bell, did you have a sudden enlightenment? That is what the sound of the bell is for. But you also have the gradual enlightenment because you've been practicing mindful eating, mindful walking, sitting meditation, so you have both, they're not two different. True realization is to live in freedom. If we have freedom, we are free from something. We are free from the knowable, we are free from the afflictions. And uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, right view, right thinking, every time we practice, the Noble Eightfold, right view, right thinking, we have freedom. We have nirvana, to live right now in this, this moment. And that is something we can all, we can all do. We can choose huh, to do that. Maybe we are part-time Buddhas, so we won't do it all the time. But we can choose to do it when we hear the bell. So in the teachings of the Buddha, there is a very uh, useful adjective. Which goes with nirvana. And Trishta Dharma means right in this very life. So it's very clear because Buddha uses this expression that you don't have to wait till you die to, to, have, to experience nirvana. Right in this very life when you can uh, see, use your perceptions, you can... experience nirvana. The uh, fifth verse of the, of the Dharmapada in Chinese, which we just looked at, about nirvana being due to causes. And the sixth verse is a very beautiful. Huh? Oh, who can sing that sixth verse for us? Somebody can, huh? To heal, huh? Oh, God, I have. Oh, I have. Who can I have? Who can I have? Who can I have? Who can I have? I? Can you, huh? Well, now. Right. 
Now we are going to listen to this uh, verse. Huh? It is the deer. They, uh, they take refuge in the countryside. The deer, they enjoy uh, being in the countryside. The birds, they take refuge in the, in the sky. They enjoy their time in the sky. The things arise because of a discrimination between and the true person enjoys their time in Oh, quick on then go up high. The true person in Rồi, xin mời mời thầy ha. Đứng ngay, đứng ngay, tới đây thì mọi người thấy được. The true person, that means the true practitioner, enjoys their time in nirvana. So we have a little break now to listen to uh, some music. Huh? Mop high, ma. Kim Bạch Sông, con kinh thơ sư mẹ, con xin hát bài Rong chơi trời phương ngoài. Con sợ quên nên con cần phải có cái bạn. Được, được. So the, in the song it said that uh, the, the, the true practitioner uh, enjoys uh, strolling, taking a stroll in the space outside of space. And the space outside of space is a way of talking about nirvana. 
because normally we uh, uh, we don't have that, that that space within us and around us. But when we have the freedom of uh, nirvana, then uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, of lot of space. And the important thing about this verse is that is the lines, true realization is to live in freedom right now in the moment, is Tai wants to tell us you can do it. It's not uh, reserved for, for some uh, enlightened arahat. Yeah, we can all uh, do that if we put our mind to, uh, to mindfulness and concentration. Uh, verse 11, the essential sutras, such as the discourses on the full awareness of breathing and the four establishments of mindfulness, show me the path to transform body and mind, step by step. So, when Tai discovered the uh, Anapanasati, the discourse on the full awareness of breathing, Tai said it's like discovering gold, but not, uh, Tai not interested in gold. <laughs> tai said that uh, it's the happiest moment of, uh, one of the happiest moments of Tai's life. Because it, uh, it, it confirmed uh, Tai's own practice that came from, from, from Tai's uh, transformation. So from that, uh, from that time, uh, we in Plum Village practice, we place a great deal of emphasis on these two sutras that have been uh, transmitted to us from, uh, from the uh, source Buddhism. So you could say that these uh, two sutras are the gradual uh, enlightenment, uh, step by step by step. Verse 12, the Mahayana sutras and teachings, I think the original word is shastras, huh? commentaries, open many fresh wide gateways, allowing me to enter the depths of the stream of meditation flowing from the original source of the Buddha's teachings. Fresh means something new. We cannot allow our, our path to become old. It has to be renewed. And there was a time when uh, a Buddhism was becoming too narrow. It was not reaching enough people. And we know that we need the collective uh, awakening. And so there were, there were practitioners, monks, nuns, lay people, who wanted to bring a breath of fresh air into the Buddhist teachings. And that is why we have the Mahayana. But the Mahayana, it never betrayed the Buddha. It is just trying to present the teachings of the Buddha in a different way. The other day, uh, we were reading the uh, Diamond Sutra. And there is a part in the Diamond Sutra, which is a dialogue between Buddha and one of the Buddha's disciples called Subhuti. And during that dialogue, suddenly the tears begin to fall from Subhuti's eyes. And he said, how wonderful, how wonderful. And I remembered that because when we were reading the sutra, I also felt tears in my eyes. I also felt how wonderful that uh, those teachings are. The teachings of the Mahayana Sutras are very different from the, from the original source sutras like the Anapanasati. Because, as I said, they wanted to reach 
a wide audience. And so they had to take something from the culture in India at that time. And people love drama. So the, the, the Mahayana Sutras are full of drama. They could be, they could be acted as, as a play. Mm. Vimalakirti, Lotus Sutra, all of those. And, um, yeah. But, uh, the, you know, in the uh, Vajrachetika, uh, the diamond that cuts through illusion sutra, there are sentences like, uh, What do you think, Subhuti? Does someone adorn a Buddha field? No, world honored one. Adorning a Buddha field is not adorning a Buddha field. And that is why it is called adorning a Buddha field. <laughs> yeah. When I read like that, and there's many sentences like that, uh, when the Buddha studied under Dipankara, did the Buddha realize anything? No, the Buddha did not uh, realize anything because uh, realizing is, uh, when the Buddha talks about realizing, it is not uh, realizing. So that is uh, the new uh, way open up. Actually, in the in the early teachings of the Buddha, of the Buddha, which we have in the Sutta Nipata, is very like what is in the Diamond Sutra, but it's put so differently. A true practitioner abandons the notion of self. This is the Sutta Nipata, and the tendency to cling to views. They are free and they do not depend on anything, even knowledge. Yeah. And in the Vajrachetika Sutra it also says, someone who practices generosity and does not depend on any notions uh, yeah, is, has a, a lot of a space. So it is the same but it is also presented in a very different way. And we are very lucky because we have the whole gamut. We have the, all the uh, original source Buddhism sutras and we also have all the Mahayana, the Mahayana sutras. And when we uh, study them, we see clearly the, how they inter are how the Mahayana and the original Theravada, what are called Theravada teachings, how they, rel- how they inter-are. And by, by studying the Mahayana, we begin to understand the Theravada more deeply. And s- some Theravada monks, they now say that uh, we really need the Mahayana. I think Jnana Ponika said something like that because it helped us to look more deeply into our Theravada Sutras. Not discriminating between the practice offered by the Tathagata and that of the ancestral teachers, the Four Noble Truths perfectly interwoven should serve as the foundation of an authentic transmission. So that is another division that people made in China. There is the Tathagata school and there is the ancestral teacher school. And the Tathagata school is all about studying the sutras, the word of the Buddha. And the ancestral school is all about uh, having a teacher who can transmit the seal of the mind from the teacher to the disciple. So we bit out of touch with the Buddha a very long time ago. And, uh, but we're very much in touch with our own teacher. And so we can receive the mind transmission from our own teacher easier than we can from the words of the Buddha. 
So this is two different ways of looking. Why don't we just use them both and then... Uh, oh, we have to have two. So one time uh, our ancestral teacher, uh, Master Linji, he went to a temple somewhere, a root temple, and uh, he walked into the temple and the temple guardian said, oh, Master, do you want to bow to the ancestral altar or do you want to bow to the Buddha altar? Because uh, most people, they chose one or the other, they didn't bow to both. So now we bow to both. Yeah? He had a cloak on and he went like that. Huh? He just flipped his cloak. Huh? Does it mean that this kind of discrimination uh, is not, uh, not the mind of Master Linji? And then the next uh, line, the Four Noble Truths perfectly interwoven should serve as the foundation of an authentic transmission. That is very deep uh, teaching from Thai. Uh, we should remember it. Mm. That whether it's, whether it's ancestral teacher, mind transmission, uh, Buddhism, or whether it's the Tathagata uh, Buddha Sutra transmission, the real basis is the Four Noble Truths. And not the Four Noble Truths as four separate things, but the Four Noble Truths perfectly interwoven. And when we recite the insight that brings us to the other shore, we always uh, recite the ill-being, the cause of ill-being, the end of ill-being, and the path are not separate self-entities. And that is something that uh, the Buddha taught very clearly. One time, uh, the Buddha's disciples, this is in the Samyutta Nikaya, were sitting together, and one of them asked, does someone who realizes the noble truth of suffering also realize the truths, the other three truths, the origin, the cessation, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. And then one of the disciples called Gavampati, he said, in the presence of the Buddha, I heard the Buddha say that the one who, rec who realizes the first noble truth of suffering at the same time realizes the origin, the cessation, and the path leading to the cessation of suffering. And someone who realizes the origin of the suffering at the same time recognizes suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the path that leads to the cessation of suffering. And so for all the noble truths. To realize one noble truth means there has to be realization of all the noble truths. Otherwise, it is not correct. A realization of the interbeing nature of the four noble truths. When you really see your suffering, you really see the path that will lead you out of it. And therefore, you see the, the, the cessation of the suffering. And of course, when you really see your suffering, you, you see the causes of it also, the food that it has been uh, given. So this is what we call the, the, the basic teaching, uh, the Four Noble Truths, which you heard many teachings on, so I don't need to go into that now. We don't have time anyway. Fourteen. Uh, Supported by the Sangha body, my practice flows easier, allowing me swiftly to realize my great determination to love and understand all beings. That is that our practice uh, needs the Sangha. The Sangha is not perfect. Why expect the Sangha to be perfect? We all have our own weaknesses. 
Maybe my weaknesses are different from your weaknesses. But uh, when we uh, take refuge in the Sangha, we accept the weaknesses of our brothers and sisters because they are there uh, supporting our practice. If they were not there, we would not have that, that uh, support for our practice, even though they may still have weaknesses. So we don't go to a cave in the mountain to, to practice. If you practice in a cave in the mountain, there will be no one there to, to irritate you. So you won't know, you think, oh, I've transformed all my irritation. But in fact, uh, when you go back to the Sangha, somebody will irritate you and you see, I never transformed it, oh dear. <laughs> so those of us who, who have the uh, nirvana with the remainder, we, we take refuge in the, the Sangha. It's true there were great masters who, who sometimes left the, 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 the uh, capital city in order to go to the mountain. But why? Because the king kept inviting them to come to be the king's advisor. And they, they felt that they, uh, they needed uh, to practice more. Kings uh, in Buddhist countries, they really like to have a monk to advise them. They feel more secure. But uh, it's very difficult for the monk because the king has to deal with other people. And uh, he cannot uh, always advise, take the advice of the monk. So the monk feels he cannot really help. So he goes up to the mountain. And then when uh, one uh, king comes and says, come up the mountain and says, uh, please uh, let me uh, stay here and practice with you. The monk says, no. <laughs> You go back to the capital and practice being a king. They need you. A king is like father uh, to his people. But uh, don't forget your don't forget your practice. We're very lucky we have the, the Sangha. That is a great uh, gift that uh, Thay has left us. Thay devoted his life to building this Sangha. So our gratitude is uh, very great for that. And uh, one way we uh, continue to express our gratitude is by continuing to build the Sangha. <laughs>